Good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Welcome to this virtual launch of the 14th out of the 16 blue papers commissioned by the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Economy, or the Ocean Panel for short. These blue papers were commissioned by the Ocean Panel to provide a comprehensive assessment of ocean science and knowledge that has significant policy relevance in support of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and the UN Decade of Ocean Science. Today's paper, The Human Relationship with Our Ocean Planet, highlights the diverse ocean values that contribute to human well-being. As with each blue paper and special report commissioned by the Ocean Panel, we hope this paper helps key decision makers better understand the opportunities for action. My name is Heather Coldway. I'm a senior marine technical advisor with the Zoological Society of London, a honorary professor at the University of Exeter, head of the Marine Science Programme for the Bertarelli Foundation and a National Geographic Fellow. And I'm very happy to introduce those who will join us for this webinar. Firstly, we are honoured to be joined by Toholo Kami, who is Special Representative for the Oceans at the Government of Fiji and Sherpa for the Prime Minister on the Ocean Panel. Toholo will provide opening remarks on the relevance of this blue paper for Fiji's work and objectives. The rest of the panel with us today are Eddie Allison, who is Research Director, Nippon Foundation Ocean Nexus Centre and Research Chair for Equity and Justice in in the Blue Economy at Worldfish and one of the paper's lead co-authors. Second, John Curian, founding member of the International Collective in support of fish workers, visiting professor at the Azim Prenji University in Bengaluru and honorary fellow at Worldfish, also a co-lead author. Narika Viratunga, anthropologist and independent scholar affiliated as a research fellow to the International Centre for Ethnic Studies, Colombo, Sri Lanka, who is a contrib contributing author to the paper. And finally, Sophie Bembo, Head of Marine, F Fauna and Flora International, which is one of the Ocean Panel's advisory member organisations. If you don't already follow the Ocean Panel on Twitter, please do. We welcome engagement throughout the webinar on Twitter and the hashtags to use are being shown on the screen now and will be available in the chat box throughout the webinar. Please do enjoy uh, the conversation. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be able, available to access via Zoom later today and by early next week on the Ocean Panel website, oceanpanel.org. Today's blue paper, along with all the other blue papers, are available on the Ocean Panel website. And for today's, today's discussion, it is a discussion. So we encourage you to post your questions as they arise over the course of the webinar. We'll get to them at the end, but please type them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen. Be clear on who you'd like to pose the question to and make it as clear a question as possible. Before we get into the substance of the blue paper, for those of you who haven't joined us before, I just wanted to provide a brief overview of the Ocean Panel. The Ocean Panel aims to facilitate a better, more resilient future for people and the planet. The goal of the Ocean Panel is to deliver a sustainable ocean economy where effective protection, sustainable production and equitable prosperity go hand in hand. Made up of 14 serving world leaders and established in uh, September 2018, the Ocean Panel has been working to achieve key objectives that include enhancing humanity's relationship with the ocean, bridging ocean health and wealth, working with diverse stakeholders, harnessing the latest ocean knowledge, and developing an action agenda for transitioning to a sustainable ocean economy. Co-chaired by Norway and Palau, the Ocean Panel is the only ocean policy body made up of serving world leaders with the authority needed to trigger, amplify and accelerate action worldwide for ocean priorities. As you can see from this map, the Ocean Panel comprises members from across the world and is supported by the UN Secretary General's Special Envoy for the Ocean. The Op Ocean Panel represents nations of highly diverse oceanic, economic and political perspectives 
They are nations large and small across all ocean basins at every stage of economic development, at every extreme of the ocean environment from the tropics to the Arctic. These nations account for nearly a third of the world's coastlines and a third of all the world's uh, exclusive economic zones, 20% of the world's fisheries and 20% of the shipping fleet. I now give the floor to Toholo Kami, Special Representative for the Oceans of the Government of Fiji and Sherpa for the Prime Minister on the Ocean Panel. Toholo, the floor is yours. Thank you, Heather, and um, I hope um, everyone can hear me. Uh, but Bula Vinaka, and greetings or good evening from Suva in Fiji, or the middle of the Pacific, um, middle of the Pacific Islands, uh, or the Pacific Ocean. Um, I'd like to just, just share a few thoughts on this, because this paper on the human relationship with our ocean planet, or the human relationship with oceans, I think is, is possibly the most critical one underpinning a transformation in terms of where we as a people on, on the planet um, have to deal with the oceans. And I, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the authors of the paper. I think it's well written. It demonstrates the diversity um, of people across the planet and this relationship that we have with the ocean. And um, also my fellow panelists as well. Um, but uh, you know, quickly, Fiji is an island nation. Um, often uh, we, we have talked about island nations as small island states. Um, we recognize ourselves as large ocean states. And we're part of the, the Pacific Island countries. For those who are not familiar with the Pacific Island countries, we have a population scattered over, over thousands of islands, but a population of some 10 million people over some 34 million square kilometers of the Pacific Ocean. And that's the Pacific Island region. In other words, 10 million people in an ocean space that's larger than the continent of Africa. And um, coming from our perspective, when we look at the human relationship, um, thousands of years of living within the world's largest ocean as voyagers, uh, we've survived the wrath of the ocean, we've thrived and we've prospered, and the ocean has become very much part of the identity of not just the Fijian people, the people of Fiji, but also the people of the Pacific. Um, I was asked uh, recently, uh, not too long ago, to talk about um, the state of the ocean, unhealthy an unhealthy ocean, um, or, and then also talk about the importance of healthy ocean to healthy people and the issue of well-being. And you know, while I was listening to the various speeches of other panelists, I changed my topic and I realized that for us in the Pacific Islands, that we've got to the stage where we're starting to see an unhealthy Pacific Ocean. And at the same time, we're seeing it some of the most unhealthy people on the planet. And it brought up this whole relationship, um, this convergence of the well-being of the ocean and the well-being of our people. And, you know, whether the disconnection of indigenous or oceanic people and the ocean how critical is that? And have we figured out what disconnection really means on this? Um, and some of these things that I know will come out with the panelists and some of our discussions later is, you know, the rethink in terms of not just around us, but looking at the well-being of the ocean being tied to the well-being of our people and vice versa. Um, and then another thought here is that the possibility that the ocean, uh, the, the inspiration or the, the ability of the ocean that many of us um, can track back. And when I say identity, it tracks back to the stories and, the, and any sense we have of our ancestors and our connections is tied to the ocean. But the possibility of the ocean must transform our hearts and minds and not just vice versa, but we must make, find and make, and make that connection. And moving beyond just policy space, but recognizing that we as human uh, beings on this planet 
are tied to nature and tied to the world's um, biggest um, ecosystem or the, the ocean itself. And here in the middle of the Pacific, that is very much a reality. I'm not gonna take this much further. I think there's, uh, there's much that will be shared in the panel. But just again, this, this emphasis on the connection, uh, the importance of the connection of people and the ocean, the importance of, of more than policy, but just minds and hearts and the reconnection with a living ocean. And what does that look like? And what does that mean? Um, I'll stop there, and, um, but I'm looking forward to the discussions tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much to Holo, and I'm looking forward to digging into that more when we get to the panel discussion at the end. I'll now hand over to Eddie Allison, one of the co-lead authors of this blue paper, to guide us through the main findings of the paper. Over to you, Eddie. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you. Thank you all for tuning in uh, to today's webinar. As we've heard, national governments and the private sector um, increasingly recognize the potential of the ocean economy and the need uh, to ensure its sustainability and equity. While there's also this growing recognition of the intangible or the, the non-material benefits uh, of the ocean to humanity, um, that we've just heard from, from Taholo, for example, we haven't yet made systematic efforts to identify, describe, and categorize these, this other diversity of ocean values. And the paper that we're presenting today begins that process. And it does so by applying two ideas. Uh, the first is that of nature's contribution to people. And, and that's an evolution of the concept of ecosystem services that many of you might be familiar with. It acknowledges the multiple ways that we value oceanic nature and environments. The second idea is that of social well-being, um, again, a word that we hear a lot, but that itself is an evolution and broadening of the concept of economic welfare to encompass other dimensions of um, a good life. So these two pr frameworks provide us with a language and a set of analytical tools that we can use to highlight the past, present, and future contribution of the ocean to meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals through an economy that's built on diverse, inclusive, and equitable relationships between people and our ocean planet. In this paper, we limit ourselves to an identification of the human ocean relationship that contributes to human well being. Other papers in this series cover the threats and the failings in our relationships with the ocean that lead to global climate change slavery at sea, marine pollution, destructive fishing, and so on. In short, here we highlight what the ocean has done for humanity rather than what humanity is, is doing to the ocean. Um, our team of 15 authors um, shown here uh, come from 11 countries on five continents. We're anthropologists, economists, geographers, a historian, a sociologist. We've got experience in several cross-disciplinary fields like fisheries, marine environmental sciences, international affairs, development studies. We've worked in policy and management advisory capacities, and most of us have worked in public, private, civil society organizations, as well as universities. And six of us have substantive experience um, of working with coastal indigenous peoples. So while we don't claim to speak for any of those groups, we can say that we have listened to a very wide range of voices from the ocean. And we've tried to represent a, a diversity of contemporary and historical perspectives in our paper and the sources that we drew on to, to write that paper. Um, next slide. Our paper is built around a framework that identifies the different ways in which the ocean contributes uh, to human well being. Um, well being is achieved if we have adequate material standard of living if we have good relations with each other and with the environments we live in. And uh, we've heard the environment we live in in the Pacific is very much an oceanic one, but many of us are also coastal. So this applies to a large uh, proportion of humanity. Um, and it uh, 
Well-being applies if we also feel that our emotional, aspirational, and spiritual needs are being met. Um, and well-being depends crucially on a blend of all three of these. Having a lot of one and not much of the other two does not lead to well-being. Um, so what we've done in our paper is to identify the ways in which our diverse relationships with the ocean contribute to these interconnected dimensions of well-being. And some of those ways are represented in the, in the boxes in, in this diagram, which um, we'll unpack a little bit later in the discussion, of um, some of them. Uh, but they're all uh, detailed in the paper. Um, we've also shown that ocean relationships influence well-being um, of individuals, societies, and indeed of a nation and of the global citizenry. And some of these relationships transcend all these levels of society, and while others are more personal. Um, I'll say for now that the, uh, only that the importance of our ocean relationships is reflected in the extent to which the ocean is represented in our languages, our symbols, our spiritualism, um, and our aesthetics. And one famous aesthetic example being Katsu, um, Katsushika Hokusai's uh, The Great Wave of Kanagawa, and you've seen this picture reproduced um, all over the place. Um, next slide, please. I want to highlight some of the key arguments in the paper before moving to our overview of opportunities for action to improve the human relationship with the ocean in the service of improved well being and of sustainable development. Our diverse ocean relationships are built on different value systems and priorities. Consider the issue of harvesting or hunting whales and other marine mammals, a controversial one. In many countries, whale harvesting or hunting contradicts um, our current value systems based on conservation, existence rights, animal welfare. In other countries, whales are respected in different ways um, and continue to be hunted for subsistence, livelihoods, and for the reinforcement of cultures and relationships with nature. 150 years ago, the ancestors of the people watching whales in the picture on the left had roamed the world in search of whales for use as essentially a biofuel. Whale fat was rendered and used for lighting homes and businesses. Huge whaling economy brought the great whales near to extinction. Alternative energy sources became available with fossil fuels and, and electricity. And with this technological change, human values also changed and people began to regard whale hunting first as unnecessary and, and then as unethical as well as unsustainable. For societies with much longer histories of whaling and much more sustainable harvesting, such relationships are different. Whale hunter in the picture on the right comes from an indigenous population in Indonesia, with thousands of years of history of hunting whales for food. They take only what is needed for their community's food needs. Such whale hunting societies don't discount the feelings of the whales that they hunt. They have relationships with marine life that's, that are more intimate than most of ours and, and just as respectful. In this, as in many other ocean relationships, we need to understand our differences and include them when we call for unified um, one ocean type visions. We have to recognize this diversity as well. Our second argument in the paper concerns the need to reconsider how we know the ocean. Much of our decision making on ocean governance is driven by a combination of oceanographic, economic and financial analysis, and legal and technical scholarship. These are all important, um, but so too are practical ocean experience, indigenous knowledge, geography, anthropology, history, and the maritime arts and humanities. It's in these arenas that our understanding of ourselves and our relationships to the ocean are built and reflected upon. Just one example, um, historical narratives drive contemporary ocean relationships. And yet maritime historians are seldom consulted in marine policy debates. Um, represented here are the 15th century voyages of Zheng He, and these inspire China's, China's contemporary ocean dream that drives its blue economy thinking. If we want to understand how China is thinking about and advancing its contemporary ocean interests, then we need to understand how the Chinese state is drawing on Zheng He's 15th century voyages. Our paper therefore draws on historical analysis um, to understand the contemporary ocean realm. 
We think that broadening the knowledge base we use to inform ocean governance um, will help us. Um, and sorry, excuse me, will help to inform ocean governance um, and leads to improved ocean decision making for equity and sustainability. Many of our important relationships with the ocean cannot be valued in monetary terms and they contribute to our well being in other ways. And here are four images um, depicting people's spiritual relationship with the ocean. The world's major religions and the older, more, more local spiritual traditions of coastal peoples all over the world all include the sea, um, the ocean to varying degrees. They indicate many types of relationship with the ocean, but two that recur frequently across different cultures are prayers and offerings for security and safety in this unpredictable um, environment. And the other one is that the ocean is involved very much in rituals for casting away of sins and washing away of worries and concerns. Security and renewal. These are the very qualities of a regenerative economy that our societies are trying to build. People seek reassurance, renewal and hope, and the ocean provides that to, to billions of people. Next slide, please. Um, our positive and evolving relationship with the ocean depends on people having continued access to it. As the oceans industrialize and anthropogenic pressures, human pressures on them increase, there's a tendency to want to protect the oceans from people. And we have in many countries already made the coast less accessible to citizens. In the US, for example, 70% of coastal land is, is privately owned. Um, an examination of surfing is useful when thinking about these issues. Surfing came from Tahiti to Hawaii in the fourth century. Um, and it was and is more than a sport or a leisure pursuit. In pre-colonial Hawaii, for three months of the year, at the peak of the surfing season, work and warfare was prohibited in a time dedicated to surfing as a form of spiritual cleansing. I'm sure many people listening here wish that we still had something like that. Um, from earliest times, women, men, and children surfed together. So it had these relational well-being components as well. Colonial accounts of surfing in Hawaii influenced the growth and popularity of sea bathing for health in Europe. Surfing itself spread globally to give rise to modern surf culture that supports a multi-billion dollar industry. More importantly, it puts a large number of people into intimate contact with the sea. An estimated 23 million people surf. That's more than the number of people who fish in the ocean for a living. And, and this is our key point. We need people to have an intimate contact with the sea if they are to really care for it and value it and to be affected positively by um, ocean values. As surf culture has evolved and spread, it's begun to diversify. Thanks to the work um, of women like uh, Dr. Eastie Britton, Irish women's surfing champion, um, who studies ocean well-being relationships um, and has also helped to develop culturally appropriate surf clothing, which has helped in turn to break down barriers to women's participation in ocean bathing and sports around the world. We now have women surfing in Senegal, Bangladesh and Iran, for example, where cultural codes around modest dress may have, prevent, may have excluded them from this kind of activity in the past. It's spread confidence, changed women's aspirations, and brought the pleasures of ocean activity to new constituents. That's just one example of how the way we relate to the ocean changes and evolves over time. It does so because we continue to access the ocean. If we lose that access, we also lose that evolutionary possibility. So the ocean is important to billions of people, many of whom have passionate views, including many people listening in uh, here, I'm sure, on how it should be governed. How do we harness this passion to help sustain both human well-being and ocean health? Our paper has five suggestions, and these are built on what we've heard the ocean citizens, those most closely connected to the ocean, say that they value. Uh, the image on the left, uh, which includes a, a banner there that says, we don't want to be rich, we just want to access, access to the sea, um, reflects a sentiment we've heard many times all over the world. It speaks to what's important to people, wider well-being, not just wealth. Uh, the suggestions we out outline are also built on the key sustainable development goal principle of no one left behind. That's in the UN preamble to the, to the SDGs. 
So inclusivity and equity are key to sustainability. The first of our actions that we suggest is to humanize the ocean narrative, put people in it. Um, blue economy visions tend to emphasize technology, finance, conservation, high level governance. They do a great job of energizing and motivating governments, businesses, and environmental movements. But people, their fears, their aspirations, their dreams, these are largely absent from these blue economy narratives and visions. Our diverse motivations and emotions um, are reduced to aggregated or abstracted talk about incentives and compliance. The human ocean relationship that we commonly describe is thus one that's, that's rather transactional in nature. To counter this, um, the perspectives of ocean citizens, these people that live with and on the sea uh, must be heard. We need to consider multiple knowledge and value systems on an equal footing, not privileging one um, way of knowing, for example, a sort of economic lens or an ecological lens. We need to put them on an equal fit footing for just and inclusive ocean governance. Um, so second, all of us here who see ourselves as ocean supporters, those of us working in NGOs and, and um, governments and philanthropies, um, should strive to include a diversity of voices in ocean decision making. We must ensure that our perspectives um, do not dominate the ocean policy discussion. And this requires that we work harder to account for gender, social, geographic and demographic differences among the ocean uh, dependent and ocean interested people. We must also ensure that the voices of the large ocean states who may have smaller populations or less power in global affairs are respected and heeded. Um, economic justice, climate justice, and blue justice all demand that our decision-making processes are inclusive of this diversity of ocean citizenry. For our decision-making to be inclusive and just, we must make greater efforts to engage in partnerships between a diversity of ocean citizens and ocean supporters. I've used Fisher Folk in these in images, but um, it applies to uh, ports and shipping workers, indigenous peoples, coastal tourists, all of us who interact with the ocean. We identify cross-generational dialogues as key to ocean futures. We've seen how young people have taken the lead on global climate action. Um, we've heard acknowledgement, the role of youth activism on ocean issues at the Economist World Ocean Summit in Abu Dhabi last year, for example. Youth voices were very prominent. In particular, we need to include the voices of small-scale fisher folk, community elders, next generation, social env and environmental activists, indigenous peoples, and women who work in the maritime economy and who steward marine environments. This will help us address some of the current imbalances uh, in whose voices get heard. To facilitate these diverse partnerships and representation, we need more participatory democracy when it comes to ocean decision making. An important way to achieve this that we stress in our paper is to stress the meso level of governance as a starting point of engagement. At this level, voices of ocean citizens are better heard and appreciated, um, and the contributions of overall well-being to the coastal community is more visible and tangible at these more local levels. So these images, small-scale fisheries, we're talking here about community-based fishery management organizations women's fish processing organizations at local and regional levels, marketing cooperatives and partnerships that all help sustain the contributions that fisheries make to um, collective social well-being. These organizations also exist in other sectors, trade unions and ports, local business organizations supporting coastal and maritime tourism, city councils, local governments. These are these meso-level organizations that make decisions that directly affect the ocean, people's access to it, and the well-being we derive from it. It's at this level that focused support can lead to transformative beneficial change. Finally, our last action. Um, our paper was completed at a time when COVID-19 um, was unfolding. We saw the global cruise tourism industry halted, uh, its vessels quarantined and tied up no longer visiting the world's scenic and historic harbors, but finding themselves in less touristic settings like the coal and steel harbor in Port Kembla in Australia in that image there. Um, 
We saw the world's seafood trade disrupted and then adapting to change, to cope with shifts in demand and the need to provide safe working conditions, um, as in this Vietnamese fish processing factory. We're now also at a moment when governments are looking to the oceans as a potential source of growth after COVID-19 related economic recession. Inclusions of the perspective that we outline in this paper may help prevent an ocean grab by powerful and economic, um, powerful economic and political actors. And it will help ensure that rebuilding is truly regenerative and equitable. The maritime sector has shown its weaknesses and its resilient strengths um, from which we will learn to build forward better. Time of rebuilding is also a time of regeneration and it is a regenerative rather than an extractive economy that the world is aspiring to build now uh, to achieve the sustainable development goals. So greater policy support and better targeted financing strategies are needed to achieve this connective regenerative set of relationships with the ocean and with each other. The focus should be to keep the coast and the littorals as realms where well-being and the stirring of the soul arising from joys and freedoms to just gaze, frolic, walk, play, swim, surf, um, are not sacrificed in the name of industrializing the ocean or selling its coasts to private interests. Keeping coastal access and ocean health must be viewed as core issues. Together, these can contribute to greater human welfare, well-being and ocean access and health leading us towards achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Let's end in the Pacific, um, where we started this, this webinar. Um, in summary, I'll leave you with this thought um, from an influential anthropologist and philosopher of the Pacific Islands, Epeli Hauofa. Um, the sea is an open and ever-flowing reality. Our oceanic identity should transcend our insularities. Um, so, to be, so we become one our identity is one of openly searching and being inventive and, and welcoming. And that's a, a good aspirational place for our societies to be looking. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, Eddie. That's uh, definitely resonated and made us think both personally and professionally. So we now are going to move to the panel discussion, uh, which will be followed by the question and answer session. So please do post your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Again, please um, articulate who you'd like the question posed to. But I want to go back. We ended on the Pacific there and, and started with uh, Taholo's eloquent um, opening uh, and the Pacific Islander identity. Um, and that continues as the region faces common threats such as climate change and as islanders meet in regional forum and, um, forums and diaspora populations extend across the world. In your view, Taholo, um, how does the shared history with the ocean forge an evolving trans-Pacific identity? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's even more important now than ever. And many of us in the midst of that discussion in terms of one is just restoration uh, in terms of connection and the traditional linkage and identity of Pacific people to the ocean. Um, not just ocean people, but the acknowledgement that we're in the middle of the world's largest ocean and that we are linked by the ocean in terms of a shared history. We're also linked by the ocean in terms of a shared future and the recognition that um, globally, the world's largest economy uh, now surrounds the Pacific Ocean. And, um, and we see a real connection between the possibility of hope in our traditional linkage and uh, with this, uh, with and through the ocean, um, not just amongst ourselves as Pacific Islanders, but also hope in terms of the possibility that those on the rim will join us um, uh, on both sides of the Pacific Ocean Rim and starting to see the ocean as something that we can identify and that we can share together. And, um, you know, while we're not the biggest polluters with climate change and that while we Pacific Island Islanders have, have made very strong positions on, on both climate and ocean issues, that there's an opportunity for 
the thinking, the rethink on the ocean to also reposition how we think of this planet. And I think we're in a position to help make that happen. What, wonderful, thank you. I'd, I'd now like to turn to um, Narika um, to look at it perhaps from a more of the um, academic framing of these concepts. Um, Narika, you present a well-being framework in the paper that includes material, re relational and subjective dimensions of well-being. How can economic development linked to the ocean be focused on improving the relational and subjective dimensions of human well-being, especially of currently excluded groups? Thank you, Heather. Uh, there are different kinds of economic development in relation to the ocean, fisheries, harbors, coastal industries, land-based tourism, cruise tourism, and so on. Uh, so these would all have different implications for improving relational and subjective well-being. Uh, let me refer to one group whose well-being is affected by economic development linked to the ocean, women. Historically, women were fully engaged in the coastal world as fishers, gleaners, fish sorters, processors, and traders, especially in non-Western societies. However, since the 19th century, their presence in coastal spaces and their multiple livelihood roles have been eroded. Maritime work and the perception of freedom associated with this work have been increasingly considered as the domain of men. This exclusion of women from the coastal marine domain, especially in engaging in small-scale fisheries-related livelihoods, has largely to do with economic development, such as the expansion of industrial fishing and construction of fisheries harbors, to which women do not have equi equitable access. Uh, this is in contrast to the past, when small-scale fisheries within fishing communities was the main form of fisheries. However, it also has to do with the cultural or ideological notions associated with patriarchy, where women's roles have increasingly been considered as wives and mothers at home. So uh, as an example, the Muslim fishing community uh, on the Sri Lankan East Coast, where we were discussing well-being with a group of women, they told us that well-being for them would mean having a women's gathering place on the beach, where they could get out of their houses and enjoy the fresh sea breeze together in the evenings. These women who, consider, uh, who considered themselves as housewives and engaged in Mm. Value on the relation. Yeah, we're, we're having a few your sound, I'm afraid. Um, okay, uh, so uh, these women who consider themselves as housewives and engage in home based livelihoods which support or complement the material pursuits of men place a significant value on the relational and subjective well being aspects of access to the beach. So the exclusion of women from coastal spaces also leads to the loss of local knowledge of the ocean and the skills that women possess. So at one end of the continuum, we have highly skilled women divers in a place like Jeju Island in Korea, diving down to depths of 10 meters to catch abalone sea urchins with no modern gear, a tradition passed on from mothers to daughters. At the other end, we have women um, in many parts of the world, going together in small groups into shallow waters for gleaning, uh, which is basically fishing without any gear, using their bare, bare hands. Uh, in fishing communities in Sri Lanka, some of these women are recognized as skilled at stroking the fish or at binding shrimps. Other women perceive that these women gleaners have special skills, almost magical powers to lure these creatures into their bare hands. So in eco planning economic development, these aspects of relational and subjective well-being of women, which are inextricably linked with their coastal livelihoods, need to be recognized and supported. All ocean citizens, including women, need to be consulted and involved in the decision making on what kind of economic development they want and what kind of balance or trade offs amongst material, relational, and, and subjective well being are acceptable to them. Wonderful. Uh, women with magical powers. I think I've met many of them around the world. Uh, John, with that in mind, uh, the paper states that those whose lives and livelihoods depend on the ocean should have, have, have their interests included more fully into this vision for a more democratic and inclusive relationship between humanity and the ocean. But what might that look like in practice and how can it be scaled? Um, thank you very much, uh, Madam uh, Moderator. And a big namaste to all the viewers and thank you for your virtual presence. Uh, 
it was Arthur C. Clarke, the English science writer and futurist who actually lived in Narika's place, uh, Sri Lanka. He made this famous statement, how inappropriate to call this planet Earth when it is clearly ocean. So to the extent that all landforms on the planet are surrounded by water, we are all islanders, not only uh, Taholo Kami and his uh, and the Pacific Islanders. Ultimately, the ocean sustains our lives and all life forms on the planet. And uh, our blue relationships or ocean values, as we call them in the paper, they depend entirely on how, where, and when we encounter the ocean. Naturally, this will be a product of geography, history, social cultural diversity, and varying economic circumstances. But let's remember that among us humans, there is a very large subset whose life and livelihoods depend on the oceans. We refer to them in our paper as ocean citizens. And they have a much closer and more intimate and evolving uh, relationship with the oceans. The large numbers among them, uh, the tens of millions, are fish workers and uh, fishers in the world. And then time professionals uh, and workers who transport goods across the ocean. They work the oil rigs. They lay the uh, seabed cables. Uh, they man our navies, they explore the ocean depths and so forth. And, uh, you know, working on and laboring on the vicissitudes of the ocean is a very special challenge. And it's not only those who work on the ocean, we shouldn't forget those who labor at the interface of ocean and land, the coastal tourism workers, the surf instructors, the coast guards, the traditional boat builders and uh, net makers, the workers of coastal cities and towns charged with the cleanliness uh, and the security of the beaches and a whole host of others. So clearly all whom we've list listed above have a very great stake in the ocean, both in the health of the ocean and in the access to the ocean. And they also have their special knowledge and wisdom, their particular forms of work organization, their unique myths and stories, and forms of governance. But allow me to focus on the group among these ocean citizens with whom I have had a close relationship and interaction over the decades. I refer here to the small scale marine fishers and fish workers. Small scale fish workers are the quintessential beacons of the ocean and guardians of the coastal commons. Estimates place their number at about 15 million. And if you add those who work in processing and distribution of the fish that these uh, catch, then the total is about 55 million. And a third of that is women. So the, a large number among them face pressing issues of, of poor social development combined with economic, cultural, and political marginalization. So what I would like to focus on here is actually a different dimension, a less appreciated one, which we have also sought to highlight in our paper. In achieving holistic well-being, ocean citizens, particularly small-scale fishers, they establish much more than a material relationship with the ocean in their pursuit of livelihood. They develop at least two kinds of relationships with the ocean and among themselves, the relational and the subjective. These are relationships which provide them with their sense of identity and community, their occupational pride and self-respect, and they see themselves as children of the sea. 
it is these relationships which account for their deep connection with nature, the sense of awe, their cooperation, their collective action, and solidarity in crisis. And we must understand that the experiential reality of highly probabilistic outcomes of their daily unpredictable and highly risky adventures over the waves is etched in their psyche. In fact, this is what undergirds their highly nuanced knowledge, practical skills. And this also accounts for their carefreeness and friendliness, their spirituality, their drive for quick conflict resolution and greater equity and inclusion in their societies. All of the above intangible attributes and values pertain to what the ocean gives to them. And these invaluable gifts belie monetary evaluation. If I may use a maritime metaphor, I would say that the pursuit of material well being is akin to using the sail or the oar or the engine of a small scale fisher's boat. This part of the boat is very obvious to the world also. However, without the less visible boat's rudder of relational values and the boat's anchor of subjective sensibilities, there can be no safe fishing trip to acquire the material well-being. And the boat, however, is an integrated unit. So together with the material outcome, it is these relational and subjective ocean values that embellish their well-being at the level of individual and the community. Perhaps it is time that we explore how such values can spread to the national and global levels. The COVID-19 crisis which we face today has made us more aware of the plurality of values and norms of behavior which we need to establish with nature and between ourselves. So acknowledging the merits of this plurality, it is time that we make a blue turn. Drawing inspiration from the small scale fishers and the host of ocean supporters, we need to engage in strong political action to resist the new drive for a blue revolution that focuses almost entirely on the material and resource aspects of the ocean. In conclusion, I want to just reiterate what Eddie had stressed in his presentation. We need to humanize the ocean narrative. And in order to achieve this, there must be greater democratization and governance of the ocean. And we need policy support and financial strategies which will build forward better. History testifies that equity, justice, and ex acceptance of plural values are always achieved through new narratives, wider participation, and political struggle. Does that sound utopic? It was Oscar Wilde who said, progress is the realization of utopias. And this is a truth that the scientific and technical com community steering ocean governance needs to recognize and plan for very diligently. Thank you, uh, Heather. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful. That's some uh, beautifully and eloquently put there, John. Thank you so much. Um, I, I wanted to dig down a little bit more into the detail and, and turn to Sophie um, with Fauna and Flora International and, and understand better your approach to human, how you build this uh, approach to human well-being in the conservation work how you support the improvement of those governance systems that are required to secure human rights. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Um, firstly, I'd really like to just congratulate all the authors on an excellent and very comprehensive paper. Um, and secondly, I would like to state that FFI fully supports the conclusion of the paper that sustainable ocean governance can only be achieved by ensuring that all those who closely interact with the ocean are included in decisions regarding future governance. So FFI works to ensure that our conservation activities do not disadvantage or undermine poor, vulnerable or marginalized people who are dependent upon or live adjacent to natural resources. And wherever possible, we would seek to conserve biodiversity 
in ways that can enhance local well-being and also social equity. We are wholly committed to respecting human rights, promoting their protection and realisation within our conservation programmes, and we aim to support governance systems that can help to secure those rights. Throughout our marine portfolio, our approach to livelihoods is designed to increase multidimensional well-being. I think, and as several people have mentioned, we invariably have a tendency to default to considering income when we think about well-being. But as articulated in the paper as well, um, FFI fully recognises that well-being is not just about income. Often of equal or even higher priority than income are basic food security needs. So do people have enough to eat? And particularly among small scale fishing communities. And FFI also considers broader social well-being in our work. So related to governance and participation, making sure that all stakeholders have a say in the decisions that will be affecting their lives. We also challenge ourselves to understand the socio-cultural and spiritual values of communities we work with and ensure that any conservation activities are culturally appropriate. And we view small scale fishing communities as key partners in our work, as Eddie mentioned in his presentation and as one of the five key opportunities flagged in the paper. We use a sustainable livelihoods approach to help achieve biodiversity outcomes. And we aim to engage and consult communities and other local stakeholders widely in both project design and implementation. It's just so important to understand the reality and complexity of people's lives and livelihoods when developing any new livelihood options as the success of any project is clearly gonna be dependent on communities actually being willing to engage with new business ideas in order to reduce the pressure on the ocean. FFI's working model is based on empowering local institutions and building local capacity for conservation, rather than creating our own footprint in a country. And where possible, we would always seek to align any conservation interventions with traditional tenure or management systems. This means ensuring that MPA development, design and management are as inclusive and rights driven as possible and prioritizing multi-use collaboratively governed sites which are built on these existing systems of fishery tenure over any more top-down government-led approaches. By using customary structures to underpin designations, we generally observe increased legitimacy for management and greater community buy-in and support to enhance long-term sustainability. And there are some great examples of this across our, our programs in Aceh and in Tanzania. Building on both John and Nareka's points, um, FFI is also really keen to ensure that gender is integrated into all of our work because we understand that the roles, aspirations, skills and knowledge of women and men differs um, and therefore the way that they affect and are affected by conservation initiatives may well also be different. In the small scale fisher marine conservation context, we particularly recognize that the roles and opinions of women are largely considered to be invisible. In many of the communities we work with, fishers are predominantly male, whereas women tend to have a, a stronger role in the processing and selling side of seafood products and also an important role in the home. So we're very aware that we must make specific efforts to enable the active participation of women in decision making around marine resource use as they stand to be affected by any proposed changes as, as much as men are. However, we do acknowledge that we as, a, as an NGO, we still have a lot to learn. Um, and it's really great to see such a seminal paper like the one that's launching today that focuses on these key issues. Um, and I'm really looking forward to integrating some of the conclusions and opportunities into our work going forward. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sophie. I wanted to turn back to um, Narika again, actually, and, and just talk about um, examples of these governance systems that uh, Sophie has touched on that reflect the multiple dimensions of well-being, um, while the relationships that humans have with the ocean and values on which they are based vary across cultures, are there lessons to be learned um, and approaches to be replicated from those more holistic approaches? Narika, are you there? <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, that's yeah. great, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, governance systems which are more holistic uh, have been eroded in the last two centuries as they confronted and negotiated the existing global economic and political systems based primarily on material values. So I cannot point to an exemplary system uh, that comprehensively incorporates all these dimensions. However, I can point to some values within local and or traditional governance systems and approaches which reflect um, these multiple dimensions. 
Um, in a recent research project, we encountered a Hindu temple in a fishing village on the east, co uh, the west coast of Sri Lanka, with an elaborate cycle of festivals which bring people together, enhancing community, social co cohesion, identity, uh, supporting the relational aspect of well-being. Leaders from the fisheries societies and other community organizations are involved in the governance committee of this temple. The rituals at the beginning of the fishing season are perceived to protect people from the dangers of the ocean and provide blessings for a bountiful harvest. So they strengthen both the spiritualist, uh, spiritualism and the sense of security linked link to making a living out of the ocean, uh, addressing the subjective well-being of people. Uh, moreover, the temple also runs the local fish market, regulating that only local people can f sell fish during the high season, while external traders can sell through local agents during the low season. So it addresses also material well-being. Uh, the location of the market within the community ensures, ensures the presence of a large proportion of women trading fish. Uh, the temple receives a commission or from each sale of um, fish. This is plowed back to the community to maintain, not only to maintain the temple and finance the festivals, but also to provide a mobile water supply during drought, pay salaries of preschool teachers, provide supplies to the local school, and a bus service to youth to commute to industries outside the community, but come back home in the evenings. So I think this is an approach with a holistic relationship to the ocean, you know, incorporating all three dimensions. In addition, I'd like to be, not be so Asia-centric. I was also fortunate enough to visit Solomon Islands uh, a couple of times of work and learn about their customary governance systems of marine re resources. And, uh, you know, most of us who grew up in the 70s might recall the Hollywood blockbuster Jaws, as in that movie, the sharks have been a symbol of the fears and uncertainties associated with the unknown depths and vastness of the ocean in our human imagination. However, in the cultures or some cultures of the Pacific, sharks have been perceived as gods or guardian spirits, which who protect and rescue individuals and communities from the dangers of the ocean or from enemy groups or guide fishers to a good catch. In this case, sharks are considered as symbolizing the bounty and the security of the ocean to those who understand and respect the ways of these powerful sea creatures. Therefore, sharks are taboo to be fished or eaten. So these are some of the relational and subjective values that underline the community-based approach to governance of uh, uh, some of the Pacific states, which they call the new song, which I think is also a title which reflects these three dimensions of well-being the new song. Uh, so lessons we can learn from these different cultures are that we need to sustain the non-material values underlying our relationships with the ocean and ensure that they remain part of our blue future. Wonderful, thank, thank you. you. So I think, I think that uh, shows some of the complexities about things that are perhaps associated with a, with a blue economy. So turning to you now, um, Eddie, I just wanted to, um, you, you talked about how the blue economy and the idea of that needs to be reclaimed as part of the humanizing the ocean narrative. In what way does the frame of reference need to shift um, and why? Um, thanks Heather. The, the term blue economy first came into um, general use probably less than a decade ago at, at the Rio Plus 20 uh, UN Sustainable Development Conference in uh, 2012. At that time, it was very much an initiative of the Association of, of Small Island States, as they were known, now the large ocean states, I guess. Um, and they saw that the, the, the emerging discussion around the, the transformation to a sustainable or green economy um, largely had a terrestrial focus. It was looking at the ways in which our land-based systems could be made greener, more sustainable. And uh, they really thought, well, how, you know, how can the large ocean states get in on this movement, um, this transformation for sustainability? What are the opportunities for greening the ocean space, not just the land, land space and land-based activities? Um, and it was also um, small-scale fishing interests that saw the blue economy as really a, a commitment to reducing inequality, because that was a big part of the, 
the transform transformation to a sustainable economy, it emphasized sustainability and equity. Um, so they, they saw it as an opportunity to gain policy support for programs to poverty reduction, improved financial and political inclusion, um, rec greater recognition of their sort of sets of values and, and interests. And so this original blue economy concept was focused on sustainability and equity transitions and in small island states and support for the rights of small scale fishers. And only later really did it become an umbrella for large scale industrialized development of the ocean. And so if this original framing of the blue economy, um, which was a product of, of really the world's ocean citizens, if, we, if it's forgotten or overlooked, then um, these large ocean states, these small scale fishers whose numbers and contributions to human well-being are, in the words of one program, uh, too big to ignore, uh, they'll simply be forgotten, overlooked, and that would be an injustice as well as a failed opportunity to help meet sustainable development goals. And that's why we feel um, this reclaiming of the original spirit of, of the blue economy is important. And that reclamation is, is fundamentally a reassertion of the human relational values um, that, it, that originally informed that concept. Wonderful, thank you. Um, I think obviously it, it, several people have touched on this already, but things are, have changed quite dramatically um, in the COVID-19 pandemic in, in which we currently live. And, and one of those industries that is part of the blue economy and, and part of people's connection with the ocean and, and their well-being is around tourism, which has slowed dramatically. So turning uh, back to you, Taholo, I just wondered about your thoughts, um, building on these opportunities of a, a blue turn, how might the tourism industry rebuild in ways that are more ben beneficial to human well-being? Yeah, you know, Fiji, um, Cook Islands, Palau, uh, many of our Pacific, Pacific and other island and coastal countries, but especially with the island countries, you get some of them with 60 to 80% dependence on a traditional approach to tourism. And so the desperate response post COVID has been, let's try restore as quick as possible. But you know, we, when we talk about what this means in context of a blue economy and in context of what it could be, um, it gives us the best opportunity to say, what kind of tourism do we need? And then what kind of tourism um, can we um, one uh, that can, can actually be owned and run by where the people live and uh, by the people of a country. At the second, the other side of it is, how does tourism and visits into our ocean-based countries um, become an opportunity to engage and educate um, in terms of a living ocean and not just this opportunity you could do anywhere else on the planet and get a suntan and uh, spend some time uh, on the beach. And I think there's this whole thing about rethinking tourism that uh, the closure is forcing us to say, do we need to do this in a way that's, that makes us more resilient um, to these challenges of a closed economy and something that uh, also links to what is most important to us as a people. And um, I think, you know, someone was talking in the midst of all the language going on about, restore, you know, we must regain and restore uh, what we've lost. Someone said, you know, maybe we need to COVID to close us down a lot, a little bit more so we can actually take on the tough decisions on recentering the, the economy around the kind of tourism we need. But uh, I must say this at the same time, the pressure is still there post COVID uh, with our politicians and our leaders saying uh, we need to get people employed, we need jobs, etc. But if we're going to do the ocean economy properly, we need to center it on what's most important. Thank you. Well, thank you. And to go to another absolutely key stakeholder group, I want to turn to you, Sophie, just to um, get some 
input into how COVID-19 has affected the small scale fishing communities that FFI works with. And again, how can those fisheries be reopened in a managed, resilient and sustainable way? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really critical question that we're all kind of struggling with at the moment. The, the small scale fishing communities that FFI works with are in, inherently vulnerable to outside impacts. Um, and the global pandemic has brought and continues to bring critical challenges, disrupting almost every aspect of life for some communities. When global seafood supply chains closed almost overnight in some countries um, as they entered lockdown, small scale fishing communities reliant on export trade routes or on supplying to tourist businesses and tourist trade found themselves with no markets for their products and they faced huge drops in their income. Um, and remote island communities are particularly at risk from this without revenue streams from fishing or tourism. There may not even be a shop on some of the smaller islands. So their dependence on trade routes by sea is just vastly magnified. In response to these basic needs, FFI has been able to repurpose some of our funding, but largely allocated to international travel, to provide some direct relief support to those island communities, um, for example, in Honduras, Myanmar and Indonesia, where they were quite simply struggling to put food on the table. Um, and we've also managed to provide some urgent support to our in-country partners in Cape Verde, San Tome and Prince Bay in Kenya, to allow them to maintain their operations and their staff and ensure that they're ready to support fishing communities as and when trade and fishing pressure picks up again. Something that we've observed in several places is a shifting, um, the shifting consumer demand that's driving the development of alternative ways of selling catch. So for example, in Scotland, FFI has actively promoted the development of local markets for small scale fishery products and secured a sensible price on these so that hopefully in the longer term, there could be a shift in trade patterns away from export to markets to Europe. As to the second part of the question, this is definitely um, the challenge for us now to ensure that fisheries can reopen in a managed and more sustainable way. The main immediate worry is that as soon as export markets are reopened and supply chains reestablished, that fishing pressure becomes immense as fishers who have struggled to make ends meet during lockdown restrictions just race to generate income as quickly as possible. But I think small scale fisheries are a naturally adaptive sector. They're capable of rapidly evolving their activities and operations in response to the changing context. And so FFI is focusing on three key ways to support the reopening of resilient fisheries. So firstly, I think building on some of the points I mentioned earlier with regards to human rights and well-being, we're continuing to support small scale fishers as the vital custodians of marine biodiversity. So by ensuring that they're able to continue participating in site level management decisions, we hope that they will remain supportive of ongoing conservation and management. Secondly, we're working to maintain responsible fishing practices. So trying to avoid the case of runaway overfishing um, by providing direct financial aid to get fishers back up and running. This might be the provision of fuel, ice or masks so that they can access markets again and then they can avoid needing to seek additional debt to cover these initial costs. And we're also actively prom promoting the expansion of appropriate market based interventions to incentivize more responsible fishing and compliance with existing rules and regulations. Finally, I think a really important consideration is the financial sustainability of coastal communities themselves and their ability to survive um, the current crisis. We have seen some positive stories in some of our sites where communities have shown surprisingly high levels of financial resilience, um, particularly where local savings and loan schemes are already well established and where communities have more diverse income sources so they're not wholly dependent on fishing or tourism. So promoting this kind of financial diversification at the local level may provide fishers and fishing communities with greater resilience to mitigate for any future shocks and provide a significant step towards improved, higher value, sustainable fisheries in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much, Sophie. <clears throat> it's certainly a very complex um, time. And uh, I now want to open up uh, to the questions that have been coming in over this really um, interesting and fascinating conversation as ever. There's never enough time to, to look at all of that. But just wanted to um, start uh, with a question I'll, I'll give to you, Eddie, actually. Um, as one of the co-leads of the paper and John chip in if you want to, but through prioritizing and synthesizing contributions to the paper, did you learn anything about how we may do the same, prioritize and accommodate multiple human values for relating to and managing 
specific ocean ecosystems? Um, yeah, I think that what we learned essentially was that because different countries are at very different stages of economic uh, and social development, have different ocean relationships, their environments are at different states. Um, although there is a, a sort of common goal and a common uh, single ocean, the necessary actions and the way to prioritize has, I think, to be decided at more local levels within this sort of overarching framework of, of thinking about, you know, what's the collective human um, good, but what will be the best thing in any one place will be very different. Um, you know, what uh, Fiji and, uh, and Sri Lanka and uh, Chile need um, will be very different in terms of, of how to prioritize and sequence these different actions and how much investment to put into into each one. And I think that requires a sort of, you know, participatory diagnostic process in each, in each geography um, involving this wide constituency of people and this broad view uh, in order to guide decision-making. But I don't think, you know, there is a, there is a sort of specific formula um, that can be applied everywhere. Right. Thank you. Thanks very much. I, I'm going to, pass the next question to John. Um, I just, uh, somebody's wanting to ask if this manner of privileging the small scale fisher as ocean citizens, <clears throat> excuse me, has the capacity to reduce the other forms of work such as migrant fish workers as less important or significant. How do, <clears throat> how do we then build partnerships within an existing hierarchy that perhaps um, our ways of talking and engaging um, reinforce? Well, <clears throat> Actually, if you look at uh, historically, the, the reason for migrant workers coming into fishery has mainly been because the small scale fishery has been destroyed and uh, neglected and uh, large scale fishery, which has been inappropriate to the ecosystem has been encouraged. So in that sense, what we are arguing for in the paper is for a, a scale, not when we talk about small scale fishing, people always think of traditional communities and so on. Well, yeah, that's important, but you can have a, a smaller scale of fishing. It doesn't have to be done only by traditional communities. In fact, migrant workers can join small scale communities. In that case, what happens is at least they learn the skill of fishing and they don't just become deck hands on the larger uh, boats and they are uh, you know exploited they are uh, they have a bad life but you have situations where migrant workers also work in small scale communities you know they become part of the community so we are i don't think these two things are necessarily in contradiction Great. I think the next question sort of builds on a little bit for that. Um, Sophie, I'm, I'm going to give this one to you. Um, so the nature of various supply chains dealing with the oceanic um, resources and communities dictate the outcomes which can be in places less harm harmonious and equitable. Could you highlight an example of a private sector supply chain or supply chains that are already the stewards of oceanic as well as economic well-being? Yeah, I think it's an interesting point. I think it's I don't know how many examples there are already, but I think it's certainly something that we should be looking towards and that engagement between public private sector needs to be a focus um, moving forward so that those those relationships and those those collaborations can be built. Um, I think it's also a useful way of bringing in funding to small scale fishers and communities where you've got private sector willing to invest to ensure that the supply chain that they then get from that is is sustainable um yeah i think yeah i think it's something that needs to needs to happen a lot more and um, ffi is looking into that um and hoping to be able to build those those collaborations great well build, building on on that um a question that i'll i'll give to you um Marika, and this actually comes from a question from from ffi so one of your colleagues there sophie but uh 
uh, looking at endeavouring to make all of the work, including marine work, more gender equitable, but no one wants to fund this aspect. How do we overcome this challenge of uh, funding linked to actually uh, gender inclusive, being more inclusive? Narika, sorry. Um, yes, can you hear me? Because I'm having yes. a problem with, uh, with the, uh, the technology. But okay, I do understand the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so this is a real problem in, in fisheries uh, and coastal kind of conservation uh, projects, especially because women are often invisible and their roles are not, not, not seen. Uh, so, uh, so first of all, you know, one has to make invisible the, the centrality of women in, in, you know, fisheries or coastal communities, the, the centrality of their role. That is, that would be, you know, one thing that is important. And, and second, I mean, women are the, the, are the center of their household. So if you can, uh, you know, convince women, then you can, for, uh, to change, uh, you know, uh, whatever you need to change uh, in terms of uh, uh, conservation uh, uh, changes in behavior and so on. I think, you know, you, you're better off if you can actually focus on women. So I think it's a, it's a way of convincing people that women are somehow central to, the, to, to, to these questions. Um, if you're uh, talking about economic development, I mean, if women are involved actually, economies do become more productive as well. So you can use that material argument as well if, if, if uh, in, in terms of funding. But these are, I guess, the, you know, the, the best answers I can give because there are, in, in funding, there's sort of um, trends. So at some point it's gender, it's at some point it's something else and so on. So, you know, one needs to uh, focus on what the, the issues are for that community where you're going to, to, to do, you know, uh, uh, implement the change and, 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 and uh, uh, show the central roles of women or the core roles of women there. Yeah, thank you, Narika. And I, and, I, and I think this is exactly the sort of purpose of this kind of um, blue paper is consolidating the evidence, uh, bringing together across SDGs, not just SDG 14 for the ocean and showing um, how powerful different approaches are to actually achieving a different kind of future and one that we all want to deliver those SDGs on time. Um, linked to that, to Holo, um, the, one of the questions has come in that uh, my observation and fear is that populations are inclined towards returning to business as usual post COVID. Is there a way that you as a panel, well, I'll, I'll put this one to you to Holo, with all your understanding and expertise can practically use COVID as an opportunity for a better way forwards for the oceans? and any examples of how this can be achieved. I think you gave some nice points on tourism, perhaps uh, thinking about some other examples from your, your let experience. Me, let me just, just briefly, both at the global and national scale, but at a global level, um, overcoming the inertia of the post-COVID recommitments of financing by governments or refinancing. And uh, what we're seeing now is this rush um, for economic recovery, um, much of the ambition of what we, we see as important for oceans um, is a threat. It's a reality that, that, that funds that could be sitting with multilaterals, funds that could be sitting within governments to do all the things that we think are important may not be available. And if there ever was a need for leadership at this time on oceans and to keep that momentum, uh, we need certain countries and people to stand up and say, we're taking a position on this and we're not going to lose momentum, that this is a recovery, an option for recovery, the blue recovery. At the national level, I, I mean, here in the Pacific, beyond tuna, um, uh, despite our talk of large ocean spaces, we don't even have organized markets for the rest of our EEZ. And uh, then starting to say, what if we were to reinvest in, in, in seafood, um, coastal farming, ocean farming with communities, world-class markets, and use this time to start to build momentum, but the ownership 
of that new emerging economy is with the people who live in these spaces. And there's this opportunity to reimagine and to reposition um, for our ocean economies, what this could look like. Otherwise, again, we're back with the extractive um, and the, well, the extractive forces that currently determine and make decisions on what this economy looks like. And those most involved with the ocean, again, are spectators and the ones that carry the burden of the, of the current downturn. And if there was any uh, ever a time that we, an opportunity to revision and to engage in a different way, it's now more than ever. I'd like to follow up with John actually just to, to expand a little bit on, on that in the context of, uh, you, you mentioned tuna and talking about uh, fish value chains. Perhaps you could give us some of your insights in a COVID and post-COVID world. Yes, <clears throat> I think uh, uh, one of the blessings of COVID comes to the small scale sector because uh, uh, unknowingly, it became very evident that, you know, the physical distancing and uh, uh, the, the ability to produce fresh fish, which the consumers wanted, you know, they wanted to have fish uh, where they knew where it was coming from or where they could buy it directly from the, the, the fisher without, uh, you know, uh, having to go to very crowded uh, ports and so on. Uh, which, you know, where the disease was spreading. So what you found is in many places, in many countries, uh, where small scale operators were in the, uh, had advantages uh, as a result of this. And I think this is getting reinforced. Uh, also things like the doing away of auctioning in some places, not that auctioning is bad, it does result in fair pricing if, if uh, there is no cartelization. But uh, we had instances where the, the fishers and the merchants and with an understanding of the consumers decided on fixed prices for say a week. And this helped the fisher because you know he knew what he was going to get. This helped the consumer because they knew what the price was. And both small scale fishers and uh, small scale consumers uh, felt that this is good. So, but this cannot be done if the value chain is very extended. So again, the, 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 uh, the premium that was being put on getting fish directly from producers was something which needs to be highlighted. And I think, in many places where fish consumption is very high, uh, this is a possibility. So of course, if you are producing fish as a commodity, then it's a different proposition. But when you are pro producing fish as food, then these possibilities increase. And I, I, I see the possibility for small scaleization, uh, localization, uh, greater uh, involvement of people, in the value chain uh, being uh, one of some of the benefits of, of the post-COVID situation. Thank you, thank you, John. Um, moving on to the next question, which is, which is quite different, and I'm, I'm going to give to, to you, Eddie, but you gave the example um, in your presentation um, linked to whaling, where communities have different traditions and values on conserving or preserving marine resources. Uh, the, person who posed this question would like to hear your thoughts on the ways to move forward with incorporating such diverse views to governance at the international level, so the macro level in your framework. Mm. Um, well, I think one of, one of the ways to do so is through the growing recognition for um, indigenous sovereignty and indigenous rights. And uh, I think many countries that contain um, sovereign indigenous nations and recognized uh, indigenous peoples within within their political borders um, have separate legal systems that pertain to resource 
interactions and um, and resource governance, including whaling. And I think you know one framework for that is is to uh, support indigenous uh, sovereignty through uh, permitting traditional forms of whale harvesting. That doesn't necessarily mean keeping everything the same, technologies, etc. But the the spirit and the relationships um, between people and natural resources, uh, I think, giving uh, indigenous societies the the autonomy, the power to um, make those relationships themselves, rather than have those relationships determined by by those outside with with different sets of values, I think is is one of the kind of macro ways of doing it. Um, I'm not an expert on on the International Whaling Commission and other, um, you know, sort of legal frameworks around international whaling. So um, that might be one that we we come back to after consulting with some of the other authors of the paper. Great. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I I think this is really summarising what's in the paper is the complexity of values that are, are highlighted and uh, the range of values that need to be considered, but it also presents the opportunity of how we can change a narrative going forwards, um, rethinking the blue economy um, and humanizing the ocean narrative. Uh, and being just because it is complicated doesn't mean it, it should be ignored. And I think at this time of all times, there's a, an absolutely immense opportunity to do things differently, to see as the examples given by John with the uh, fishy, fishing uh, value chains, there's huge opportunities to build on those ways of getting it right, getting it differently and benefiting people at all aspects and being a lot more inclusive in the process. So just to summarise, I think this um, is a, a, a huge point in time. This paper couldn't have been more timely, although I imagine it was very challenging to actually incorporate all of the variables that come with a uh, the global pandemic and the associated challenging situations so for so many people and also the economy but at the same time this is when we are reconnecting with those values that are so important and can start to rethink about this idea of a, a blue turn a different way of doing things and a way of doing things a bit better that is going to build a far more sustainable future and an ocean human economy and approach to life that is completely different uh, than what we've seen before, but is going to actually go about delivering all of the SDGs uh, beyond SDG 14, but to uh, bring in all of those factors. Um, not to mention reminding us of the, the importance and magic of the ocean. It's actually outside my window here, and, and it is uh, um, something that is incredibly important from a personal perspective to all of us, as well as professionally for those of us luckily enough to work in association in a various ways of this wonderful panel um, on the ocean. So I'd just like to uh, wrap up by thanking um, the panel. I think it was a fantastic representation of a really important blue paper, um, a really interesting set of views from across the world and across sectors. Um, I really appreciate the time and the eloquence in which you presented uh, both the science the, um, and the philosophy behind the paper and the diverse disciplines and narratives that were brought into it that really make us think. So I would like to move now to the uh, final slides. And that's to encourage you all to read the full paper. Um, it has an enormous breadth of knowledge and references and information um, in it. Um, it can be seen on the uh, website uh, oceanpanel.org um, and is online already, so you can read that there. Um, and if you haven't followed uh, Ocean Panel, please do connect with that conversation. And finally, um, the next Ocean Panel uh, webinar date is still to be confirmed. So please follow on Twitter uh, to, to see when that's going to happen or if you opted to receive information about webinars and events when you registered for this one, um, you will receive an email invitation for all future events. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoyed the session as much as I did. And thanks again to uh, an amazing set of panelists covering an incredibly important topic about our ocean and our values.
Thank you.